Hello and welcome back to the great changing of ways. Yes, I am the heir of Zinch, and we are going to be continuing our Oracles of Zinch campaign in Total War Warhammer 3. Appreciate all the folks who have been viewing, suggesting names, leaving comments, dropping by, being silent, whatever it is. If you're enjoying watching it, then thank you. I'm glad to have you here. Let's get things started right where we left off. We were getting ready to fight the Battle of the Brass Citadel. I was sitting here thinking about my army. I think we need to make some changes because the battle for the Brass Citadel is going to be against, obviously, Corn. And Corn, Blood Letters, for instance, let's just take a few units. There's going to be plenty of them in the battle. They're terrible on approach to a Zinch army because they get eaten up by the missiles, but they're excellent once they get into combat. Large units from Corn, so let's say like a Blood Shrine or. Blood, or, uh, yeah, bloodthirst or stuff like that. That's going to be a problem, right? We're not really built for that in this particular army, so it could be an issue. So what I'm thinking of doing here, we need to have more Forsaken. We need to have a couple more pinks, way less blue, and we're going to need some more screamers for anti-large work, but we're going to need a good number of screamers in order to tie down enemies. So I want to do a few things. Um, and it's going to take me a while because it's going to have to come through global recruitment. But first and foremost, I'm going to get rid of these Furies. They just don't really serve the purpose that I need from them here. Um, so this, like I said, it's going to take a few turns. We take a look at what's available to us. We have Exalted Pinks. They're going to cost way more upkeep though. I mean, just money is way too tight for that. Um, we can We can afford quite a bit, but... I mean, if you take a look at, like, the difference between the pink and the exalted pink, they get they do get way better melee defense. Uh, they do have a decent bit more attack. Their weapon strength is only a modest amount better. Um, but, I mean, they do way more range damage as well. So, exalted pinks are definitely nice. Um, and it'd be good to have, but it's four turns of recruitment. Spawn are heavy damage, um, but they lack armor, so they're going to take a ton of damage in return. Like I said, we kind of need these screamers... Um, for specific anti-large duty. Eternal. And I think I'm going to ditch some blues. But I'm going to do it one unit at a time. So we are in enemy territory here. Our replenishment is just painfully slow right now. Just awful slow. But at the same time, like I don't want to start getting another... I'm saying we're gonna have to wait here a few more teens, turns than I want. And we're just gonna have to keep an eye on the other factions that are there and make sure that if they do get enough um, bloodshed, that they don't make it into the uh, into the fight first, right? So we're just gonna have to make sure we cut them off. Now, back at the home front here, let's take a look at buildings. I'm gonna go to each province. I'd like to have a little more growth here so we can upgrade the Volary. And at Karak Doom, I'm going to put in a little bit of income. With the damnation. Um, probably want to just start upgrading these smaller settlements. But I'm going to sit on a little money because I might have to do some global recruitment and we're about to need a little more money. We're ready for more research as well. I'm going to do this way of prognostication to open a, uh, a different... You know, uh, changing of the ways. Speaking of changing the ways, we're in a cooldown still on most of the actions that we want to take, so there's not much I can do at the moment from a changing of the ways standpoint. So let's end our turn, keep our recruitment going, and let's get better prepared for the great battle at the Brass Citadel. We might get attacked by Hod there. If we do, that's a battle I'll have to fight because I can't afford to take crappy losses from the auto-resolve. Yep, he did attack us. And it's saying we're going to take medium casualties. I, I disagree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I don't want to waste time on this battle, though, so I'm not going to show this battle because it is going to be a waste of time. Brass Citadel is a very long battle, and I really want this episode to focus in on that. So I'm going to skip this battle, maybe even another turn end or two where I'm just sitting there. And we're going to skip the uh, fluff and bring you all the meat, okay? All right, I'm back about four turns later. And I so Greasus is getting close to being able to fight the battle. I don't want to have to kill Greasus and then try and replenish with Grog running around too. 
My army is not as good as I would like it to be at this point, but it's good enough. I've got four screamers, which can be great at tying up bloodthirsters and doing a lot of damage to them. And uh, then I've got some Forsaken to help me be a little strong on the ground. Plus, this is a survival battle, so we are going to have access to a lot of um, reinforcing units. Uh, you can see that the auto resolve is honestly probably being pretty nice to me because this can be a tough fight, but we aren't going to auto resolve this type of fight, so I will see you all on the battlefield. The Brass Citadel, the Keep of the Blood God, home of the Skull Throne. The Citadel is guarded by 888 bloodthirsters, but we need only breach its outer defenses to draw out the Gatekeeper. Start at the ruined fort, defeat its garrison, and capture the Icon of Ruin. This will give you a foothold and grant us supplies to reinforce for the struggle ahead. There are two other Icons you will need to capture, and so dominate the battle. You have drawn the Blood God's gaze. Make sure you are worthy of his attention. Let the slaughter begin. All right, welcome to the Brass Citadel, folks. It's where it's all going down. We gotta fight Korn's Gatekeeper. So uh, Kairos and his army are going to move forward to try and capture the first icon here. There are some minimal defenders here. It's going to be Bloodletters of Corn and some Warhounds. So pretty low armor defenders, though these defenders will be very good against infantry uh, if I allow them to get into a melee. So that's what Bloodletters are going to be best at. You get those guys into a melee and they will be absolutely brutal against low armor infantry like that which Zinch has. However, Zinch has a couple of advantages that should be pretty apparent for those watching this campaign so far, which is the missiles um, from range will absolutely shred bloodletters as they lack armor and shields. And then you also have a barrier, and the barrier provides basically a certain amount of charge protection uh, when it really comes down to it, um, because it will shrug off that initial damage. Now, of course, there's a price to pay there. Zinch units typically have lower hit points because they also have the rechargeable barrier, but still, one way or the other, it is quite handy. So I'm going to use my single entities to blob things up, make a mess. Basically, I want to not let the bloodletters get into any good charges with my troops. I'll use my Forsaken um, to get in here and do a little bit of cleanup work. Do you remember that I now have four Forsaken? I have four Screamers. The, the Screamers are going to be... Well, they're going to be my... Uh, anti-demon control, right? They're my flying purple demon eaters. If we're going to uh, go along with here, maybe we need to name one of them that. But so we've got the uh, <laughs> we've got the screamers, and they will be useful later as we start to run into bloodthirsters and the demon prince himself. Now my troops are going to capture the first um, icon here, and I'm going to show you what I do. I'm going to fast forward for a moment. There's going to be some times in this where it's a little less than cinematic, and honestly, I may skip chunks of it where it's in between action, because on these survival battles, sometimes you get into a capture point, and then you're kind of resetting and getting ready and going to the next one. There's a lot of walking involved, and just kind of, I mean, it's, it's important to the battle, but it's not as cinematic, so I may cut it out. Um, so let me show you what I'm doing real quick with buildings. I am going to go ahead and put some towers across the back, um, here, I like this to help defend the back lines because the back kind of gets attacked non-stop uh, during the other phases of this survival battle. So I do go ahead and build towers here. Now this is optional. There's lots of different ways you can play the survival battle. Like you can upgrade your troops, you can bring in more troops, you can put in buildings, you know, you can get more magic, you can get more heals, you can put more armor and more tad. There's a lot of ways you can approach. We're be kind of using a mixed bag. So back here at the first icon, I'm going to be using the towers because I feel like it's helpful here. Um, however, when we move forward, I'm going to swap up my tactics a little, and I'll show you all what that looks like. Let's get a good look at all of our troops here since we are in cinematic mode, waiting on some enemies to approach our Forsaken of Zinch, looking pretty awesome here. I love the coloring in the Oracles of Zinch, and then our little pinky horrors here. <laughs> stabby, stabby. And we got our flamers. Some pretty odd looking, but really fun units to use. Very high damage, very high risk reward. Here's, here's Kill Scribe, our Scribe of Fates on his Chaos Steed. Let's check this out here. 
Here comes some uh, Flesh Hounds. Flesh Hounds are also excellent units against Zinch, but unsupported like this, again, they lack armor, they don't have a shield, they're going to take an absolute shellacking. But if a lot of units like that get into your troops, you're in trouble. Speaking of trouble, we've got corn coming from all sides. You can see how my magic towers have played out. Now, this is the most expensive tower you can buy. It fires quickly, does a lot of damage, and uh, will take a ton of hit points off of our enemies. I'm going to use my single entities to kind of clog up the uh, sides rather than spending money on buildings that they're just going to tear down, um, which the AI will. They'll just tear your buildings down regardless. You can't really hold. Uh, so I don't see a whole lot of point to building these back here, as there's really no reason for me to be delaying. Again, I'm going to use my single entities, create a blob, and then we're going to start using our Zainchi magic in order to destroy said blobs. And a lot of spend of my um, supply points here is going to be me um, spending on magic and ammunition and heals. And I will do some unit upgrades later, though. I normally don't even mess with unit upgrades much, but Zinch plays different, especially in this battle against Korn. Zinch is not meant to just sit around in a melee slog, but because of the way these survival battles work, you are going to get in a couple of melee slogs. Um, and so you kind of have to swap up the way things are going to work, right? So later on, I will be applying some upgrades to my Forsaken and to my Screamers. And speaking of Screamers, I got some in here to help us get rid of these Flesh Hounds. Um, I want to make sure these units don't really get to do a whole lot of damage to my pinks. Check out this sweet... Zinch uh, Vortex over here. We killed a ton of Blood Letters. That was uh, Krang who did that. And then on this side, Kairos is just clogging up all the Blood Letters. It's doing that thing where it goes into slow-mo. I think it's because of the spells. I think we were about to spin up another spell. Um, I have used Pendulum with Kairos, and Pendulum is very effective at breaking up blobs as well. It's very, very good. So you can see Kairos will take a little damage. Not a huge deal. I'm not going to let him die, and we can apply some healing to him as well. We're down to 30% left on this wave, and most of the units were funneling into these little choke points. I knew they would do this if I didn't you know, build the buildings, and so this was intentional funnel these units into the choke point and then destroy them with single entities, non-stop tower fire, and then also magic. Whereas on the main um, pathways here, I just let my, uh, my horrors and flamers and towers basically do the work for me, right? The enemy's not accomplishing much on the main pathways. See those towers just firing away. It'd be interesting to know when you get to the end of the battle what um, number of kills the towers we're able to achieve. I'm going to use an army ability here too, which is like a lightning strike that reduces armor and does some damage. It's a, it just recharges over time, so you might as well use it as much as you want. Oh, I thought I was going to strike there. Didn't ever see it come down. Some sweet animations on Kairos, by the way. That's pretty much it. There's really not much left in this wave. Um, there's a few troops kind of approaching, um, just odd and in stuff, but they're mostly dead. Um, so what's going to happen is it's going to open up the gates and we're going to be able to move towards the second icon. I'm going to actually skip over a little bit and go show you all when I'm ready to start taking that point, and I'll explain what I did to defend this point and what we're doing to take the next one. All right, I am up at the icon of blood, which is going to be our second objective. I've brought my pinks and my flamers up front to do the missile damage. I went ahead and dropped the vortex because the enemy troops are just going to be walking right through it here. Um, this is going to be the firestorm of Zinch, which is a little less predictable, so you don't want to do it around your own troops, but it is absolutely devastating to any unit that it comes into contact with. Even that light contact right here did a lot of damage. See, look at this unit, it's going to get absolutely wrecked when those get in there. So. Basically, using the magic and the, um, the bottleneck, look at this. The enemy troops were all bottlenecked moving along the edge of the map here, and they just walked right into this infernal gateway. And they're going to get all killed. Like, it's just going to absolutely kill them. Look at the kills on Krang after that, because he's the one that cast that 270 kills. <laughs> so Krang just wiped out several units of blood letters. So that was a very effective way for me to deal with the defenders at this second icon. Rather than coming around both sides and splitting my forces, I came around all in one, concentrated my missile fire, concentrated my magic, because there's a very limited area for corn to operate in here, which made them particularly vulnerable to Zinch's ability to cause damage over an area with missiles and magic. So we're going to take the second icon, 
In the back, I have left Kill Scribe with a small contingent of blue horrors, and he is going to hold um, this first icon that we captured here. That is going to be the uh, icon of ruin. Um, so the icon of ruin is under his control, and this is why I built the towers. I have three towers because I only have three blue horrors, and then Kill Scribe here. Although he is an epic character, he's not an epic melee character. Um, so he's going to need the help of those towers. So the Icon of Ruin will be left his uh, control. And no doubt he will be uh, scribing up the fates there. And now we are going to be in control of the Icon of Blood. Once again, I'm going to fast forward and explain some of the change. Actually, I can explain one change already. You see this gold sword above my Forsaken? I put upgrades on them with gold weapon, and it gives him 40% more base, 40% more armor piercing, 30% more melee attack. So basically this turns my Forsaken into an extremely strong infantry unit. It costs quite a lot. It cost me 4,800 supplies. It was about um, 1,200 supplies each um, to upgrade those Forsaken. And um, what I'm planning on is this third icon that we have to go capture, which is farther back up here. There's going to be a lot of enemy infantry that gets on top of us quickly, and we will get forced to fight in a melee, which again, Zinch doesn't like. That's why I'm using this Forsaken. And that's why I'm going to uh, actually get more of them and do the same thing to them later. So it's going to become an important part of my strategy for winning the battle up here at the Icon of Torment, which is where we will face the Demon Prince. But before then, we've got to face Wave 2, um, which is just now starting to come in from the flanks of the map. You can see some blood letters portaling in over there. And there's going to be more. Now, I did not build any towers here. I normally do like to build towers. Again, Zinch does not like to sit around in a melee. And so you might be like, well, Air, isn't that even all the more reason to build the towers? It is, but there's a lot of towers here. There's three right here. If you build the best towers, then that's 6,000 supplies. And there's two more, actually four. There's a ton. There's just way more tower positions. If you build all these out, you're going to use all your supplies. That's going to leave you really hurting for reinforcements in that final battle where you have to face extremely strong demon prince it's like 15,000 hit points or something very powerful and remember we don't have like halberds or anything like say cafe would get uh, we don't have a lot of um, guns like say kislev would get where it's really quick and easy for us to shoot up a unit that's just not going to be the case so what we're going to need to win as zinch in the third wave attack is we are going to need tons of reinforcements and our melee reinforcements, like the Forsaken, are going to need to be upgraded. And so that is the strategy I'm going to use. We will see whether or not it works. It has worked well so far, as my Forsaken are absolute monsters in melee, and they are getting a lot of kills. And remember that they're getting that many kills, despite the fact that I'm using so much magic and missiles. Here comes the first round of Flesh Hounds. I'm gonna let that barrier on the pinks absorb the hit. You can see I'm now calling in more Forsaken. And I'm gonna be sending these Forsaken to continue to support. So that's four more units of Forsaken that came in. I have not upgraded them yet, but I will. So now I have plenty of Forsaken to hold things off. And again, I'm gonna be using my single entities to kind of cheese the enemy infantry, cause extra damage, hurt their leadership. And I do have to be careful. Like right there, Krang got overextended for a little too long because he got stuck in the Flesh Hounds. You can see here, I'm going to push the Forsaken forward. And these Forsaken, against unarmored targets like Bloodletters and Flesh Hounds, they are going to hit like a truck with a rocket engine. Um, they have like 80-something weapon damage. It is insane how hard they are going to hit. So they will be doing tremendous damage. And I'm going to be using spells. Like right now, I'm using Zinch's Treason, which also takes away melee attack from the Bloodletters. So these guys have almost no melee attack, and they're going straight into the hands of my Forsaken, who have massive melee attack and huge uh, damage that they deal in melee. So I'm going to be at a, a huge advantage here. And then with the charging in of my different chariot units in Kairos, we are going to be absolutely taking a crap on Korn's infantry, which under normal circumstances, in a close quarters fight like this, without the benefit of having... Um, Without the benefit of having uh, magic and missiles, Horn would win any day, right? But we are basically using what's given to us in these battles to take away Korn's advantage um, and turn it into our own advantage. There we go, you can see my soul grinder 
Kairos, and now I'm gonna bring all my Screamers in, because we're starting to get a pretty big blog of blob of bloodletters, and I don't want to spend a whole bunch more magic. It's gonna cost me a lot of supplies to build all that magic back up, so I'm gonna go ahead and use the Screamers. Not made for anti-infantry purposes, but when a unit like these bloodletters gets piled up this hard, they're gonna get wrecked because they're completely surrounded and they're gonna crumble. That's exactly what happens. So I'm gonna just absolutely obliterate multiple units of bloodletters all at once. And we're gonna end up with a pretty darn efficient victory here. There's a few more bloodletters around. Some of them got into my paints over here. So I'm gonna have to send some help. Here comes Soul Patchy to help clean that up. Bloodletters uh, do armor piercing damage. So they're not terrible against these single entities, but they're anti-infantry focused. So they're not great. Um, they'll get a little bit of damage done, but they'll take a ton of damage in return. So at this point, the Icon of Blood is pretty much under my control, and Wave 2 is defeated, which means um, that I'm going to be getting some preparation done, and we're going to be going and fight for the Icon of Torment, and I will show you what I've done when we're ready for that fight. All right, now I had mentioned to you earlier that we were going to be making heavy use of highly upgraded Forsaken, my four new Forsaken that I called in. Um, have now all had the gold weapon upgrade as well, and I teleported out my more damaged Forsaken and then teleported them back in so that they would have full unit complements and they would be healed. So that's what I've done with most of my Forsaken. I put the missiles out front again, and my single entities are ready to cheese enemy infantry. However, we have a new target here. It's going to be a Bloodthirster. Bloodthirster is a large target that is very good at AP anti-large damage. Um, he's got a lot of hit points, and he's not going to sit still and let us just pepper him with, you know, like pink um, pink horrors or blue horrors. So we're not going to be able to take him out the same way we do on a normal battlefield. So what we're going to do instead is this is why I brought the Flying Purple Demon Eaters, which is my Screamers. And not only did I upgrade the Forsaken, I gold weapon upgraded the Screamers. Look at the disgusting stats on these Screamers. Now, they don't have, like, huge attack. It's only 34, but look at the weapon damage. 84, and it's AP anti-large. And remember that I have four units of these, and they're going to come in and just start absolutely eating the life out of this Bloodthirster. You can see he is losing hit points at an extremely rapid pace, and he's going to really struggle. Uh, even though he's anti-large, he's going to struggle to fight back against this many Screamers. So he is in a really bad position, and those Screamers are also going to be used against the Demon Prince. Now in the meantime, again, I cheesed up some of the enemy infantry. I'm gonna use a pendulum here to eat through a bunch of blood letters. And then I'm gonna collapse my chariots. I got the hot rod there. And then Kairos and Krang are gonna dive into battle soon enough, potentially as well, um, to just help crumble these units. So look at this, Bloodthirster. I don't know what he's thirsty for, but it ain't gonna be blood. <laughs> he is getting absolutely wrecked. You can see now he's uh, crumbling, disintegrating basically and uh, just unrelenting from my Screamers. They just will not get off of them. And they're not going to either. So there goes the uh, Bloodthirster. He's gonna fall into the pit. Kind of a This is Sparta type fashion. So he's gone, and we are now ready to go take the Icon and prepare ourselves for the third and final battle. Um, or sorry, the, I guess technically fourth because that was wave. Wave three, or we're gonna have Demon Wave three. This is, yes, I guess technically it's the third and final battle, even though you have kind of some minor battles for each icon. So I'm gonna get all my troops moving up. Chaos has now been routed. We're gonna come up and capture the Icon of Torment. And then over here shortly, you will see the appearance of Korn's Gatekeeper. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you how I plan to fight him. And I think you pretty much know my Forsaken are all upgraded, so now they can hold off Korn's infantry quite effectively. Um, and then I'm going to have my Pinks, who are already here, my Flamers. My Screamers are going to be in good shape. Um, they took very little damage thanks to their barriers. So I've got my four Screamers who are going to immediately attack Demon Prince because he's an airborne unit, and they're just going to relentlessly swarm him and give us that anti-large damage. So that is the plan. Bog down the, um, bog down the Demon Prince with the Screamers, and then call in overwhelming reinforcements for everything else. And I do have a lot of cash, so check this out for reinforcements, what we are going to do. I'm pulling is I'm pulling more magic in, so I'm using Arcane Surge, and I'm calling in more magic for Kairos, so we're going to build up all of his reserves. And look at the Lords of Change start to flow in, so there's three Lords of Change that I've called in. 
these are units that are similar to Kairos, um, except not as much magic. Um, I've also called in Doom Knights. I've got two units of Doom Knights. I'm going to start spreading these units out and positioning them. And then I also called in a unit of uh, Exalted Pink Horrors. And at the moment, I am now out of supplies, but we will be building up more. So, again, Corn's now I have... Gatecorn's Gatekeeper. This is the Demon Prince whose soul we seek. All right, so now we have overwhelming capability when it comes to our troops. Um, so we should be in a good position to keep Corn back. Because remember, though, Corn is better in melee than us for sure. So all these upgrades and extra reinforcements will really, really help. So you can see the Demon Prince gets immediately swamped by Screamers. And again, this dude is no slouch. He is a boss in melee. So not only did I swamp him, I hit him with two different debuffs, which is going to take his melee attack down to near zero. You can see we're already chewing into his hit points. And I'm going to bring in Kairos to help block him. And then I've done a charge with all of my Forsaken straight into the Blood Letters. And remember that my Forsaken are heavily upgraded, so they're going to be in excellent shape. My Doom Knights are going to go after Chariots. You can see the uh, the blood, blood Shrines of Corn being chased by Doom Knights. And my Forsaken are holding the line quite beautifully right now. I've sent another unit of uh, Blood Knights out here to hunt down a Hell Cannon. Uh, they probably won't be fully successful because there'll be more reinforcements, but they'll keep that Hell Cannon from shooting my key units. My Lords of Change here, who kind of look a lot like Sartorial, uh, almost exactly like him in fact, um, are over here smacking down the uh, Cornish infantry. And you can see that the uh, Demon Prince himself now wrapped up with Kairos and about four dozen Screamers. And the Screamers are great because they're tanking some hit points for Kairos. And they are absolutely mauling this demon. He is down under 50% health. And remember that this is all melee. I've, I've gotten hardly any missile shots in because there's not really a great angle for it. Um, so we're in really, really good shape overall uh, in terms of defeating this demon wave. Over here, the combination of Insane Forsaken, Lords of Change, and Soul Grinder, and Doom Knights is definitely making all the difference against the uh, Blood Crushers and the Blood Letters. So we're having very good success on this flank. My pink, uh, my pink missiles in the back are all safe now as well. Continued relentless swarming of the Demon Prince. And he is taking his toll, just to show you how tough this guy is. He was up against four units of Screamers. You can see the Screamers and Kairos are all taking a beating. That's despite the overwhelming numbers, plus the pot shots from the pink horror. So now you know why I prepared so seriously I did bring in a second Soul Grinder as reinforcement. So now I've got even more single entity mass uh, to throw around. Some Minotaurs of Corn showed up. My Pinks and my Flamers quickly got on them because they are low armor and they suffered horrendously. <laughs> the hands of my missiles and my melee there. So the Minotaurs of Corn gonna be turned away. You see a pendulum going off there for Kairos to help clean up the infantry and other units on that flank. Very effective. I'm bringing in another Lord of Change. So now the Demon Prince is in big trouble. He's having to face a lot of units. We're going to cycle back in with Kairos. He's just getting desperate now, and he got killed. So the Demon Prince is down, and now we just have to mop up the rest of his troops, which is only at 20%. So strategy was very effective. If you find yourself next week playing this campaign and you're wondering how to approach this battle against Korn, uh, this way certainly worked for me. I don't know that I guess it would work every time or all these different difficulty levels, but I found this battle with uh, Zinch against Korn actually a little bit more challenging because Zinch just does not like these blob fights, but once you run the unit upgrades, don't build the towers at the... Uh, in fact, I didn't build anything at the second um, icon, and I didn't build anything at the third icon either. I used all that money for upgrades and overwhelming reinforcements and it just worked out way better uh, against Korn. Sorry, it's popping into slow motion. That's that's a result of whenever I'm casting spells and other abilities, it makes it go into slow motion in the game, and it does it in the replays too. It's kind of annoying. I wish it didn't do it in the replays, but it does. There's probably an option I can turn off to figure it out, but you all can bear with me. So these Blood Shrines of Korn are actually some of the most effective units that Korn has. And again, if you don't have all the right reinforcements, they can be a huge pain. 
corn mower, as I've lovingly called it, uh, is difficult to stop from a mass standpoint. And Zinch doesn't have a lot of mass outside of, like, Doom Knights. See here, I've got my flyers chasing down a skull cannon, which is kind of like a ranged version of the corn mower. And they are putting a beating on it. And that is really all that's left uh, for corn at this point. He's been utterly defeated. So there goes one blood shrine. And then here comes the skull cannon, which is now going to be the object of affection for my whole army. Down she goes. And that, folks, is one successful battle on the Brass Citadel. Now enjoy the cutscenes on the backside. That was an epic throwdown if I've ever seen one. We got 400 kills with Krang. Did 8,621 damage. He probably took home MVP. And I think it was mostly just from that one Vortex spell, but in my opinion, the MVP definitely went to these Forsaken that we upgraded. Um, they just absolutely crapped on Blood Letters. And then another very important part of the strategy I used here was this uh, flock of Screamers that was kind of our anti-demon force. And they did a fantastic job of that. They got upgraded, they had ludicrous attack, and there's just so many of them, they were able to overwhelm the extremely powerful demon prince that we had to fight up against. So I think this was a very productive outing. I'm actually going to take the cash and go ahead and scoot from the realm of corn with our demon soul, putting us on the scoreboard. The first soul harvested. When all four have been gathered, they will combine into a single light, revealing a shadow path to the Forge of Souls. Then Urson will be within our reach. But what's this? The tome consumes the soul's energy, reaching across time, revealing secrets. It was the Old Ones that shaped this world into a paradise. Yet the power they harnessed to move sun and rock could not be tamed. Raw magic erupted from the Great Cataclysm, flowing forth from a realm of chaos. So came the demons. They hunted the mortals, feeding on their souls. Yet one of their prey betrayed his kin and embraced the gods of chaos. They gifted him demonhood, and he became the first demon prince, Belakor. He clawed at the world, scarred it with his armies, reveling in the bloodshed. Those who seek power will always want more, and Belakor's lust was the greatest of all. Gods of chaos, have I not fed you souls? Have I not given you the world? Give me more power. Answer me! The four gods punished the demon prince for his arrogance. They took everything. His armies, his power, his form. 
curse to roam the world as a shadow amongst the shadows, powerless for eternity. Damn the gods. Bellacor has spent millennia planning his revenge on the Chaos Gods. What twisted scheme has his dark mind constructed? Alright, well, there is the story so far, folks. That was quite the episode. We got a Demon Prince's soul. We, upon the mortal we have to continue. Once more, having and we are back into Mortal Lands, where we can continue ever-changing the ways of all those around us. So we will get back to some fun, and I would say that that was a pretty successful foray into the Realms of Chaos. I might tinker with this army a little um, before we go use it for something else, but uh, obviously we'll have to do some rebuilding. Hope you all enjoyed the episode. Era of Carthage, signing out from Zinchland. I'll see you all next time. <laughs>